because it might be interesting for posterity and we'll likely delete it. Shannon and I talked about doing like another version of this later so that the actual video seems a little bit more cogent and thoughtful, yeah, but well, I think- also, If Carl's clipping this up, we can have two versions for him to clip from. That's true. Although everyone will be wearing different clothes, but that's okay. Um, probably not me, cause I, I just wear the same shit. Um, what's that? We put on the same shirt and it's only you and Tiffany. So me and Michael ain't showing our- I do it. <laughs> you should um you should totally show your faces by the way if you have the means to um Bye. okay so tiffany this is why we're holding this meeting so we as a company um ha we had 15 employees during that era that i was just describing and we were burning as you remember from the princeton talk like a lot of money right like almost two hundred thousand dollars a month which was investor money from friends and family and we were getting pretty low in that money. We had like a month and a half left. So we had 300K in the bank, which is a ton of money for a young company. But when you're burning almost 200K a month, that goes up in smoke in less than two months. So, you know, Shane and I being the leaders at the company, we're basically like, we're going to run out of cash. So we need to raise money. Tried to raise money as per my talk that you heard, failed to raise money, which was very humbling. And then basically decided to sell. So we trimmed the company because when someone acquires you, you know, they don't want to acquire something that's just atrophying money because then they have to pay for that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, we trimmed to be like a more swallowable pill. In other words, if we can be as close to profitable as possible, then we're not a hole in their canoe when they finally acquire us. So I trimmed in order to sell, started a sales process, got two buyers we had six people that were vaguely interested and then two that were quite interested. And we had five or six conversations with them. And there was another entity that does roll-ups. Do you know what that is? No. Um, so roll-ups are usually like a private equity thing. So private equity um, companies invest in a lot of ways, but one of, one of the main ways private equity invests is distressed assets. So companies that aren't doing so hot and they'll buy them and fix them or they'll buy them and roll them up into like six other companies that are similar and create one super company that sort of has efficiencies, economies of scale. They'll bring in like an operations team to really like tighten it, tighten everything. So it's quite common to do roll ups where you acquire six things in one industry and turn it into one powerful company. So there's been a lot of talk in the, in the, shadows that I've heard about a roll up in the sort of influencer marketing content space, because there are a lot of small players, they're very fractured. And so wouldn't it be nice if one PE private equity company could roll them up into one power company. So I was talking to one company that kind of does roll ups, and they were going to buy us for 300 K maybe. Um, and they notoriously do cash deals only. So they don't buy for equity, they buy for cash. So I'd get 300 K cash. And they move fast. Usually when a company buys you, they have to do diligence for months. It takes a long time. They make decisions in two weeks and send you a check. It's very quick and dirty. So I was considering that to go fast and just get some cash and get out. And then the other two deals, one of them would be mostly cash. And then the other one would be mostly equity. The significance of mostly equity is that, for example, Shannon, who has a, you know, an equity shape, you know, stake in our company, that equity stake, instead of getting paid out in cash, would get paid out in stock of the company that buys us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So instead of owning a piece of the hub, which she you know, is, has been absolutely core to, she would own an equity stake in a much larger company that she doesn't really give too much of a shit about. And she's, instead of taking risk in a baby that she really loves and cares about, she's taking risk in a completely foreign entity. So it's kind of a shitty way to get acquired. In any case, we had those offers and then COVID hit and they got pulled and the big company that was going to buy us for cash might go out of business. The smaller one that was going to buy us for equity still might or still might make us an offer. Um, but Shannon and I are really enjoying what we're doing. And so we're not really for sale right now. Um, that said, we got, we trimmed the company way down and we got to a place where we're nearly profitable, but we're not profitable, Tiffany. 
And so the way that we have become profitable, as I told you in the presentation and the rest of the crew, we're a profitable business. But what that hides is that our core business, the hub, which connects photographers to brands through a software product and takes 18% of the money that changes hands, um, that's only spinning off 11, 12K a month right now. And the company costs about 30K to run. It will be more once we pay you. And if we were to bring on someone else like Grace, 31, 32, 33K. So we make 12, we spend 30, we're at a deficit of $18,000. And so the way that we're doing it right now is basically Shannon and I are, instead of spending all of our time focusing on growing the marketplace, which is what we should be doing and being very focused, we're having side hustles. So I'm consulting as a CMO, chief marketing officer for four or five other companies and making money doing that. And Shannon is consulting as a sort of agency content specialist, helping brands figure out what kinds of content they need. And between the two of us, we're bringing in, you know, 20 grand a month or so. And so we're able to be profitable, even though our core business model is not. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's cool. Like Shannon and I are really proud of the fact that we're basically keeping our heads above water. You know, being a profitable startup is like a big accomplishment. I'm also very proud that we have product market fit, that like our software works. Like I think Michael can attest, even since he's been here, and I'll let you speak for yourself, Michael. Um, even since he's been here, and, and, and it's not a coincidence, like it's a lot of what Michael has brought to the table. Um, more and more brands are using us and maybe more to the point, more and more brands are returning and really liking us and giving superlative feedback. We have a lot of happy photographers. So product market fit, meaning the, the product we've built, the software is really servicing these brands that we're speaking to, like they're getting real value. And it feels like we're really, in my opinion, and Shannon and Michael at any point, please speak up. We're really solving a real problem, Tiffany. Um, which is like a small little thought, but it's actually the biggest of thoughts. Like a lot of startups have an idea and they think it's good and then they bring it out to market and the market's like, I don't know, like I'm not that into that. And that's why most startups die or at least young ones. So finding product market fit is a huge accomplishment. So I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that even though that core business model isn't profitable, that Shannon and I are hustling and being entrepreneurs and making our baby profitable. So we're able to bootstrap, we're able to continue and be beholden to no one, no investor. We are masters of our own ship. But the problem we're trying to solve for is that it's sort of exhausting. You know, we're spending, there hasn't been a weekend that's gone by since Michael's worked here that I haven't worked, that Shannon hasn't worked, even Michael, right? Even Michael's working weekends and not getting paid any extra for it, I might add. And that's enlivening. And I, we've all communicated to each other how inspired we each feel, which has been for me really vindicating because there have been moments of this company where I've felt very trapped by it, very heavy, very sort of enslaved by my own creation, so to speak. Um, but lately I feel very, I just feel very lucky. Like I feel very um, happy. Um, and again, Shannon and Michael, I don't want to speak for you, but they, they've expressed similar sentiments that they just really love what they do. They feel connected to it. They believe in it. So there's a lot of good happening here, Tiffany. But the question is, if I were to, you know, I'm moving back to Brooklyn, which is where my apartment is in six months if I were to get back there and want to live a normal life and like have a fun weekend, I can't really do that. Right. If Shannon, I don't know, started dating some guy and wanted to just like sign off at 5 PM and not worrying, worry about her emails anymore. Michael, you know, plans to, and likely will go back to focusing fully on school in September, October, November, December, and we'll lose him. So when any of those things happen, we're kind of fucked. And so what this conversation is all about is 
a contingency plan, which is raising money in six months. And so if we can basically come up with a deck, a presentation that we're proud of an investor deck that is, will be true in six months. So it's not true today. It's what we're aiming for. Then when we wake up in six months, if we're tapped and Shannon looks at me and I look at Shannon and we're like, can't do this anymore. Like I got to focus on my significant other or my mental health, or I just want to be a normal 20 something and go to bars and have fun. We can take investor money and work hard, but work 50 hours a week and work solely on the hub as opposed to like, you know, I have calls all day tomorrow with founders. I get calls at 9 PM. I get calls at 6 AM. Like I'm never turning off. And so that freedom from that could be nice. And so that's what we're sort of toying with right now is do we want to give up some of our freedom for a little bit of breathing room? Does that make sense? Or do you have any questions about that? Um, no, I think that makes sense. So is the goal basically like you wouldn't have your side businesses anymore? That's right. Okay. We, I mean, we, you know, and, it, and it's a spectrum, right? It doesn't have to be on off, but it might be like, like I had a client, um, one of our old coworkers actually has been helping me with it, which is kind of a nice um, chain of events. Um, but we had a two hour call with them on Friday, Thursday, and it was lovely. Like they were so grateful for the work we're doing. We feel very connected to them. We believe in their company. They're a joy to work with. Um, and both uh, this young woman whose name is also Shannon and myself got off the phone and we were like, that was so nice. Like I would love to spend my Thursday afternoons doing that. And they're paying us money, right? Like what a, what a great thing. So there's certain clients that we might keep, you know, and it's like a great way to bring in extra money. It's a great way to spread the word about what we're doing. It's a great way to get people to post jobs on our platform. Um, but something we've talked about already, even though we're just flirting with profitability, Tiffany, like just above the line, we talk a lot about morale and loving what we do and keeping it that way. And so what I always say to Shannon and she says back to me is like, if we're not loving it, if a client sucks, we get rid of the client because whatever they're paying us isn't worth tanking our morale, which will have ripple effects across the whole company. So I sent a very strongly worded email to a brand that did 6 billion with a B in sales last year and could completely change our company forever if I just sucked it up and let them sort of treat us poorly. But they were putting a big strain on us. And so I basically told them like, we don't want to work with them anymore. And so we're doing this strategic thing where we're just protecting morale at all costs and making sure that this crazy unsustainable lifestyle is as sustainable as possible because in theory, we love what we do. Michael, Shannon, anything you guys want to add to that? No, all makes sense to me. Nothing for me either. Guys, <laughs> this is an unfortunate trope, Tiffany. I, I just kind of like talk a lot and then I, I, people never want to add anything and it's either because they agree or they're just so fucking tired of talking that they just don't. Yeah, it's like you explain things so well thought out and so specifically and like we agree with them. <laughs> you are our leader. I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you, Shannon, for your kind words. Tiffany, do you have any questions, anything unclear or like, or just like, why don't you do this instead? Or like, because there are lots of ways to skin this cat, you know? Um, yeah, I guess I just feel like it's very interesting that you were so close to selling. And then if COVID hadn't happened, you like we wouldn't be here right now. So I guess I'm just curious, like, I, I don't know how... I don't know. I don't know. Like how, do you feel like something might happen where you get back to that point where you're ready to sell? Um, do you think it was something about COVID specifically that like changed your mind? Or, yeah. yeah. I, think, I mean, uh, Shannon, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, you know, cause I, yeah. I was, you know, a really hard thing for me, Tiffany is like, it's not just me, right? Like in many ways, this was a very personal thing I was going through. I struggled with depression. So I was like depressed. I was ending a romantic relationship. We had 15 employees. The company was torching money. Like it's just, what's up? I said hashtag sane. 
we yeah, both Shannon, going through breakups. <laughs> Shannon was going through a breakup. Like we were both in a like, you know, this is the thing about startups, right? Like it's your fucking life. And then when your life is also throwing you curveballs, like Shannon and I have seen each other through like multiple breakups each, you know, deaths of family, mental health, like, and that just, it's not a normal job where like you kind of keep that shit to the side. Like you feel it, right? Cause we're working all the time. So like, I just know intimate details about Shannon's life and vice versa. And you have to trust the other, like it's, it's a really intimate, you know, relationship like between Shannon and I, and when we've had other, you know, employees that we really trust, it's the same thing. So it's a really, really, really good question, but it's sort of like asking someone like, you thought you were going to marry that person and you didn't. And now you live in Austin, Texas, instead of New York, like what happened? It's sort of like, well, geez, you know, I wasn't a happy person. I was working my ass off. I didn't think we could turn the corner with this company. I tried to raise, which took every fiber of strength that I had, which wasn't a lot, right? Like, cause most of my energy was going towards trying to save my romantic relationship and trying to, not be depressed and figure that out. And I took literally all I had left and I put it into this race. Assuming that like, if I pulled it together, we haven't like the company's impressive enough and it will speak for itself. And I'm verbal enough and I can turn on charm, even if I'm feeling a little dead inside and I can pull this off, I can do this. And then we got 34 no's at 34 fucking inter, you know, uh, VC meetings. So the feedback was resounding that we're not ready. And that was just crushing because it was like, I it was literally took every ounce of strength I had to even go through that process. And then to get all those no's, it's just like, oof. So it was like, okay, dead end, right? And like, that's the thing about entrepreneurship. Like you hit dead ends all the time. Have you heard of the term like pivot? Like you got to pivot your company? Um, no, not really, but I feel like I can guess. Yeah. So it's like a trope in entrepreneurship. Like a pivot is basically, it usually refers to changing your business model or like changing something quite sizable about your company. And like, you just change it very quickly on a dime. And something I've always mused over Tiffany is like a pivot happens when you hit a brick wall. Like I thought this business model was going to work, but it didn't. So we're going to change our business model completely. The difference between failure and pivoting is whether you stop or not, which is like a very simple thought, but it's sort of an elegant one. I think it's like you hit a brick wall and you're like, fuck this. I'm out. That's quitting. You hit a brick wall and you're like, I'm going to completely change my company and do something totally different. And like, we're going to sell different products in different ways to a different audience. That's called a pivot. And it's sort of heroic and venerated in the entrepreneur community, but it's the same fucking thing, which is you hit a brick wall and you completely change how you're acting. One is quitting, one is pivoting, but it's the same thing really. So we hit a brick wall. I'm like, okay, got to sell. And I was ready to sell. And as you point out, COVID was the only thing that changed that I was going to, you know, I was done. And I was very embarrassed to share that with Shannon because she's been in the trenches bleeding with me and I didn't want to give up on her, but she was sort of like ready to, I think we both were tapped in certain ways. And I think COVID has been very reductive for all of us. I don't know your experience, Tiffany, but it's been a thing where a lot of things in your life have like you not going back to Princeton this fall. A lot of things have been chopped off. Like you can't, spend time with friends as much, or you can't do this hobby as much, or you, you know, certain things that you enjoyed are no longer available. And so it really makes you question the the fundamental things. And so I think our company basically got chopped, like all the tentacles, all the employees, our office, like everything shrunk and it came back to its essence. And it's such a fucking cliche, but I think at least for me, and I I don't want to speak for Shannon, but you find the, the meaning in the rubble you find like, like where it all began, like what are the good bits? I'm like, oh, we like built all this stuff, but that was all kind of unnecessary. And thank God this earthquake just came because now I can kind of see like what should have been and what should not have been. And so the company we've rebuilt since COVID hit is tight. 
and it's tight around things that bring us joy. It's tight around things that seem to bring our clients uh, some semblance of, of fulfillment, happiness, joy, our, our creators. And so COVID in many ways, yes, was sort of a saving grace and that it, again, it was like an earthquake we didn't ask for, but it kind of like shook everything to the ground and enabled us to rebuild in a new image. It, it was a forced pivot, so to speak. Yeah. And like, we were ready to sell. You were like, I'm selling by what, like May 1st or something. And May, then May we, started, we started quarantining in March. So it was also like, by then we're like, well, A, we're not going to sell to anybody right now. And B, like, what are we even going to do with our time? <laughs> like everyone's quarantined. So we have to just keep doing this. And then we found to love it. Yeah. You know? So it's been a kind of a cool thing, you know, just like I think with all of us in COVID, I, I know a lot of friends who are kind of miserable, even though they're not sick or they haven't lost their jobs. They're just like, I can't do any of the things I like. And some people are like, I've refound that I really enjoy exercise or really enjoy this hobby or these relationships or like it's reduced and so they or they're spending more like you like they're spending more time with their family or you know when you went to Princeton you probably thought like I'm going to see my family four or five times a year for the next 20 30 years like that's what happens when you move out and all of a sudden now you're living with them and um, so for me that's been really nice more time with my family so I'm rambling but the point is yeah, it's been fucking weird. Like you're putting your finger right, right where you ought to. Um, and I'm not a big, like, I, I'm not religious, nor am I really that sort of spiritual. Like, I don't think the universe made this happen for a reason or some shit, but I do think it gave Shannon and I a forced opportunity to take a beat and really question like what we want to do, what we really care about and what this company is really all about. And it's been really cool, like rebuilding, say with Michael, like someone coming in with fresh eyes and he doesn't know all the baggage. He doesn't know all the history and like him seeing beauty in our rubble. Right. And like helping to build, which is what you'll have the opportunity to do because we're still so small compared to what we were. And so anyone coming in with any sort of capability and desire and passion as, as Michael has in spades, he's been able to, you know, take his life force, apply it to something. And unlike some huge company where you barely notice the difference, like our company has lurched forward in many ways, thanks to expertise and passion and just time that Michael's put in. And so too will be the case with what you bring, which is to say we're very small. There are things that really need a, a loving set of hands and a passionate, wide-eyed, engaged young woman or person. And so your contributions will have an outsized impact, which I think is like, not to get too philosophical on you, but I think that's what, I think that's where happiness lies more broadly and why Shannon and I are feeling so happy about our jobs is that we put out what we're good at into the world and we're getting good response back from the world and we're feeling a sense of fulfillment and connectivity to what we're doing. Um, and that on a personal note is very filling. And then on just a professional note, I think our company is healthier than it's been in a long time because of that fact. So we can get um, as wide or as heady as you want. I'm happy to, you know, chat about this more either in this chat or, or a future one. Um, let's, let's do the exercise, which is I haven't heard of anyone else doing this, which is weird to me because it feels sort of obvious, but you know, we had the unfortunate experience of thinking we were hot shit trying to raise and failing to, right? And so this time around, I really want to reverse engineer it. I want to make a deck that isn't true yet and take it to investors and show it to them as if it is, not as a lie, but to say, this is the deck that we're going to show you in six months. How do you feel about it? And have them give us commentary on that future state of the company and modify it and say, I want to see this instead of that, or this is a red flag, or you should really be focused more on that. And as we tighten that deck around the feedback of some friendly on, uh, VCs, I, I'm, you know, I know, um, we'll be able to create what I call a beach, like something that we're sailing towards and then reverse engineer the company. And we might not use this option, Tiffany. You might not be around and Michael might not because you'll be back at school. But there's a really good chance that Shannon and I just keep bootstrapping it. 
but we want to have the option where if we're tapped or if we're not enjoying it as much anymore, instead of feeling hollow and just doing it because we have to, we want the option of raising some money, being able to kill our side hustles and just really focus in again on the core business without the pressure of being profitable. So that's what this exercise is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is just rooting us again. I don't know your, your background in, um, you know, venture, um, and how much you know about this stuff. Um, you know, a seed round is typically the first round a, a company raises in the past five years. There's something called a pre seed, which is, as it sounds like it's a smaller round that precedes the seed round seed rounds 10 years ago, Tiffany, literally 10 were, I call it, I, this is my phrase that I haven't heard elsewhere, but a team in a dream. We have a good group of people. Like we have a couple experts in the room. Um, this is our TAM slide, total addressable market. So we have an idea. This is how big it could get. And this is the team that's going to get us there. And that and that alone 10 years ago could get you a check for a million bucks. Team in a dream. And maybe a wireframe or like a prototype. But now the goal, goal post had shifted. That's much more pre-seed now. And seed, you're expected to have like quite a lot of progress to show for yourself. Maybe even product market fit. 10 years ago, series A was product market fit. So you need to demonstrate diagnostically with mathematical tools and data that you have, that the, pro the market you are speaking to is responding favorably and consistently to your product. Now product market fit has shifted down to seed. So everything's gotten a lot harder in the past 10 years. You have to have much more progress and be much more um, sort of evolved or the thinking needs to have you know, sort of uh, congealed or established itself a bit more to raise money, right? So this is from our 2018, so already a bit dated, but it's like one of the more helpful things I've found, which is it explains, and by the way, Tiffany, like you can raise money for anything, right? Like e-com businesses or you name it. Um, marketplaces are particularly tricky. And so this is what they call the marketplace napkin because it's sort of drawn on a napkin. And they describe in broad strokes what it takes to raise money in 2018. And again, it's probably changed in the past two years. But a seed round, which is what we'd be raising, or maybe even a pre-seed, what you need is $50,000 or, or I should say less than $50,000 or euros of uh, net revenue. As I said, we're doing 11. So we're certainly less than 50. GMV is the amount of money that passes from brands to creators in our case, from, from demand to supply. So in Uber, it would be passengers to drivers. Um, so the total amount of money that passes with brands posting jobs on our platform with no interaction with us whatsoever was $32,000 last month. But when you add the jobs that Shannon put through the platform to on behalf of some brands, it goes up to 60. So with Shannon, we're in this range, although on the lower end of it, and without Shannon, we are below it. And that's a bit of a tricky thing, Tiffany, because like technically, like a lot of brands come to us and they're like, I don't have time to post and manage jobs. Can you do it for me? And Shannon does it for them. It's still going through our platform. So I think it still counts, but it's something I'm a little worried about because it's not quite the business model that's not scalable, like having Shannon as a bottleneck. So this number is really, I think what we should be focused on and make sure that this is over 50 K and then this can just be bonus points. Does that make sense? Yeah. 10% growth monthly. We're sort of targeting five before we are thinking about raising. So if we want to raise, we're going to have to ramp up how quickly we're growing and the number of jobs that we're generating month over month. Um, our burn. So I'm really proud of the fact that again, we were burning a shit ton of money. You know, if we were burning even hundred K 18 months would be $1.8 million to keep the company just at its exact spot. But since we're only burning $10,000 right now, or, or I guess 20,000, depending on how you count, you know, even raising $200,000 would generate 
18 months of runway for us. So if I had 200K in the bank right now, Shannon and I could quit our side hustles and for 18 months, just focus on the hub. I want to raise more than 200K because I want to hire developers. I want to hire replacements for you and Michael when you go to school that are full-time employees. You know, I want to, I don't want to be at 15 employees, but I want to be back up to five or six. And so we're going to need to raise 500K to a million at least to cover our current burn, but then initial, uh, sorry, um, incremental burn for new employees, not to mention marketing the product more. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, valuation three to 8 million. I think that's low. I've heard higher, you know, usually seed rounds are, are sort of for marketplaces are more like six to 12 in my experience, but who knows round size, one to 3 million bucks, a $3 million seed is a monster. I think we'd probably target a two at most or a pre-seed, which would be more like 500K. So this is the amount of money we'd raise and this is the valuation we'd raise it at. So like, you know, 1 million at a 5 million valuation or 2 million at a 10 million valuation, something like that. Usually in funding rounds, you give up 20% of the company. So 2 million at a 10 would be 20, 1 million at a five would be 20, that kind of thing. Make sense? Mm -hmm team domain expertise and unique insights. So we have profound domain expertise because I come from an agency background. Shannon's now like a very formidable producer, not to mention she was a professional photographer before this. So we know that world very well. I know brands, she knows creators. And then Jason, our developer is a incredibly talented developer who's worked for Lockheed Martin, whatever. So I'd say we are doing pretty well. We're learning and moving fast. Certainly everyone can attest to that. Liquidity, this is really where we're going to put you, Tiffany. I think I mentioned this word to you on the phone. So the idea is motion, movement in between supply and demand. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, GMV would be the way to measure that, like how much money is changing hands between brands and creators every single month, how many jobs are being completed, you know, how much are creators being paid. These are all bits of data that we're going to have you track and pay close attention to with the goal being as much liquidity as possible. So I'm really excited about this box guys, because liquidity, enthusiastic early users, initial transactions. So we've had over 600 transactions. We have not just like a few users who are vaguely enthusiastic. We have like, dozens of photographers who love us. We have dozens of brands who love us already. And this is without you working your magic, Tiffany, on like really owning where supply meets demand and that fault line. But enthusiastic early users and initial transactions would be a very, very, very pessimistic and conservative way of describing what we have. So even today, I think we're well past that description. And I can only hope that in six months we'll be eons past that. Demand side dynamics. So this, this, this is you, Tiffany, this, this box right here. So if you have questions, this would be the best place to ask them because this is really what we're gonna have you focus on. Demand side dynamics, varying conversion from engagement to transaction. So in our case, People post a job and then some people never complete the job because they find a photographer elsewhere or they just forget, but we have a very high conversion of job posts to completion and we've had over 600 completions. So once again, I would say even today, this is beneath where we are, which is quite exciting. Supply side dynamics, revenue, not yet material to suppliers, but promising. So we have tens of thousands of photographers on the platform, most of whom have never made a dollar with us. So that sucks. But what's cool is our top 20 creators will make almost 400K in the next year. So an average of 20K each. So I'd say that's material. Like $20,000 is, is not an insignificant amount of money. And our top five creators will make their full living on the platform you know, they'll make 40, 50, $60,000. And so I really want to spend some time on this slide in our deck, Tiffany, because this is what you're going to build. 
and we're going to create a future state that doesn't exist yet about, and, and I might have you tweak this slide in the coming weeks. Like, what do we want our demand side dynamics to be? What do we want our supply side dynamics to be? In other words, our top 20 photographers, how much money have they made? If we were to fast forward six months and look back, how much money will they have made? If we were to talk about our top 20 or 50 brands, how many jobs have they posted? So how can we tell a story of that blows these sort of watered down descriptions of like varying conversion from engagement to trend? No, it's like hundreds of transactions will have occurred. Brands are coming back in throngs. That's like a completely different picture. Revenue not yet material. What if we had a, a slide with testimonials from creators being like, this changed my life. Like I was able to quit my job and focus on photography for the first time ever. Like that blows the revenue, not yet material suppliers, but promising. We want to blow that out of the water. So I think this box, which is your box will be what we build the raise around actually. So that either will terrify you or really enliven you because the work that you're going to do with us over the, over the coming months will be quite literally like the, the keystone of the presentation. Be why? Because this box, I think we can improve these numbers, but we're still going to be like in this range and probably in the lower half of it. So we'll have $100,000 of GMV. So it, it's not like we're going to blow this out of the water and have $400,000 of GMV and, and that will be a layup. We might not grow 10% monthly. We might be closer to five. So this I'm going to have to talk to and explain and play a little defense. And this is where I'll play my offense is. Yeah. You know how all these like watered down things and you have like young marketplaces coming in that are just kind of figuring themselves out. We are, we've hit our fucking stride and this is where you're going to live. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shannon, Michael, anything to add? Nothing for me. Makes sense. Yeah, nothing for me either. Looks great. Um, so network effects, you know, this is something we talk a lot about. These guys are really tired of me hearing, talking about it, Tiffany, but like, this is the, the benefit of fresh blood. I can, can use my old talk tracks all over again. So, you know, we, I met with, um, quite an accomplished investor, like one of, one of the top in the country. Um, he was the, the fifth employee at Facebook. And then he was the second employee at LinkedIn, <laughs> which is just insane. Lightning strikes twice sometimes. And then he became a venture capitalist and um, his fund is a very, very small fund that shoots bullseyes. So their last fund, fund five was like, an early stake in Uber, an early stake in Snapchat, an early stake in um, Birchbox, an early stake in, I can't remember, like five or six companies that have just gone to the moon, Rent, Rent the Runway, or like one of the, one of the female like Glossier, something like that. Anyway, they've just crushed it. So I met with him and before his time at the fund, they were the first money into eBay. And he told me this story about eBay, when they put the first 10 million bucks into eBay, was an, an auction house for one thing and one thing only, exotic fishing tackle. So if you wanted to buy a cool fishing lure or sell an old fishing lure of your grandfather's or something, you went onto eBay.com and that's what it was, period, end of story. And they were able to build traction and a network effect where everyone on the internet that was looking to buy or sell fishing tackle went to this website. And then they started. So off the back of that story, I was like, Shannon, we got to pick a lane. We got to pick a lane. And we were trying to figure out what it was. And I don't really know why, but we just kind of landed on food and Bev, you know, cool packaged food products or cold brew coffee or you name it. So as you might've noticed, you know, 90% of the work that's on our platform is food and beverage companies. So we're in a motherfucking lane. And the benefit of that is this next part, which is network effects. So network effects kicking in with each additional buyer or seller, increasing value of the platform for other users. So this is another place you'll live. Like why does having loyal brands make it a better experience for creators? Why does having loyal creators make it a better experience for brands? 
but also this idea of brands telling brands, creators telling creators, like people wanting to join our community because they've heard of what an incredible place it is. And luckily, because we picked such a small lane, which is like small up and coming CPG companies, there are only a couple thousand that are really, really good. And they're probably 10 or 20,000 total. And that's it. And so when we hit a critical mass and we've created really good work for a couple thousand of them, in theory, there's a line somewhere where they start talking to each other because they go to the same conferences and they're in the same Slack channels and they, you know, same Facebook groups and they're friends with each other, went to college together, whatever. And all of a sudden word starts spreading. So just to give you an idea, there was a gentleman that came in that went to Princeton with me. He's two years older. He's a consultant and he quit to start his own company. So I said, before you do that, will you come consult for me and tell me what we're doing wrong? It was really helpful. His name is Jameson. He's a great guy. And um, we had a great time. He's one of the best freelancers we've ever worked with in my experience anyway, and got a lot out of it. And it was a big reason why we were able to trim our costs so quickly and so well is because he was able to show me where all the inefficiencies were, Tiffany. But he introduced me to a friend who started a cool company, Shannon and I are obsessed with called Can, C-A-N-N. -N. It's a cannabis infused beverage out of um, California. And they're white hot right now. They just raised 5 million bucks. They're like going to the moon. And I was just talking to one of our other favorite clients, one of our first clients, um, Rise, which is this brand here, Rise Brewing Co. Um, and I'm still friends with, you know, the senior people there. Melissa, who's the COO, is like an absolute, you know, powerhouse. So she's about to have a baby and we were just shooting the shit and catching up. And Wait, yeah. Melissa's having a baby? Yeah, in two months. Crazy. I know. She's still gunning like a crazy person. But anyway, we were talking and... Uh, she's like, how can I help? And I was like, oh, like, Melissa, you're about to have a kid. Like, da, da, da. But I was like, you know what? If you do hear about cool brands, you know, because you have your ear to the ground and you kind of know what, there are a lot of brands that think they're cool, but then they're the ones that are actually breaking through. And it would be helpful if you could help me identify people before they pop so that I can work with them. And so when they, I, I just texted Shannon last night, one of our favorite clients from a couple months ago, just raised a bunch of money from very serious angels. And we did work for him a long time ago. We haven't done our best work for him. And I was pissed because he had a huge Forbes article and it had like mediocre photography in it. And I'm like, that should be our photography. Um, like we should have shot for him. We should have seen this coming. How can we like get out in front before these brands pop next time? So I said to Melissa, if you know brands that are going to pop, let me know so I can like give them discounted shoots and make friends with them and give them awesome content. So when they do pop, we're associated with that story. And I was like, and she's like, okay, yeah, I'll think about it. And I was like, yeah, for example, like there's this brand I'm obsessed with right now, Can. And she's like, James, I introduced you to Can. And I'm like, no, actually you didn't. It was my friend Jameson. You know, he went to, to business school with, with Luke, the founder. And she's like, I went to college with Luke, the founder. And I'm telling you, I introduced you to Can. And I'm like, Melissa, I like remember Jameson calling me and like, it was Jameson, I'm sorry. And then she hangs up the phone and forwards me an email from a year ago LOL. where she That's did in fair. fact introduce me to Luke from Can, and nothing came of it until Jameson introduced me. But it just shows you how small this world is and this network effect concept of like, if we crush it for Can, then all of a sudden they tell that and everyone knows. And the last part of that story is there's a design agency called Red Antler that you should look into. They've done, they're basically two, Red Antler and Gin Lane. And between the two of them, any cool company that you know of in the consumer space, Sweetgreen, Casper, Warby Parker, Allbirds, any like millennially cool, hip consumer company. Any subway ad you've ever seen. Any subway ad if you've been to New York recently, like any like hip like, oh, that looks crisp. And like, I kind of want to spend $200 on that blah, 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 like toothbrush or whatever. Quip, the toothbrush company. Um, they all have had logos and the initial branding experience and so on made by Red Antler or Gin Lane. So one of the ways I endeared myself to Can very quickly is 
I got on the sales call. He's like, hello. And I just go red antler or gin lane. He's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, red antler or gin lane. He's like, red antler. How'd you know? And it's like, well, you, you're so fucking pristine as a company. There's only two companies I know of in the country that can do work like that. And it's either red antler or gin lane. And I was right. Right. And we need to become the red antler of content where like if a young company raises some money and they're like, where do I go for content? Hub, the hub, easy, like done. That's the answer. And we'll get there right in the next, it might, maybe even while you're working here, but certainly in the next year or two, if we cross that thousand, 2000 threshold, it will get to a point where word of mouth will spread and we'll start seeing network effects. Um, and then market potential, which I think is like a pretty easy one just to show that like content's massive and this could be a billion dollar company if we played our cards, right? That kind of thing. Investors like to know that it could get really, really, really big. So that's kind of the world. And like, we need to build a, a deck that kind of answers to these benchmarks. So we can take a quick pause. I'm happy to answer any questions or people can just have a break from me screaming into the microphone. And then I think we'll just really quickly in broad strokes, try to build this out for the last hour. And I don't know that we'll get through it or get through it in that much detail, but it's just putting a flag on the ground and we can do this again on another weekend or whatever, but of like, what is the company that we're setting out to build? What is our true North for the next six months? So does anyone have any questions about this or thoughts or reflections either about these parameters or the idea of raising at all or any, any thoughts? Um, the only thing that scares me on that napkin is the 10% growth, which I know you said is not like completely necessary yet. Um, but yeah, everything else like seems really easy for us to accomplish. Yeah, it scares me too. Cause the last time we did that, as you know, and as you know, from the presentation, Tiffany, we did it in an unhealthy way, right? We, we just flooded our funnel. And if our whole thing is quality and building brick by brick, that's kind of in violation of trying to grow quickly. And 10% is pretty aggressive. And as you know, Shannon, from that talk I sent you from Kamaf Palahapatiya, I love this guy, Kamaf Palahapatiya. I highly recommend you guys watch him, Michael and Tiffany. He was maybe employee 20 at Facebook, and he's largely responsible for their growth, which is to say everything. Brilliant guy, brilliant investor, and he speaks so well. He explains things so clearly. And I've just learned a lot from watching his interviews and stuff online, Kamath Palahapatiya. Um, but he talks about how, you know, investors walk into their first board meeting and they're like, how fast are you growing? Oh, cool. You need to grow a lot faster. Like Luke at Can was telling me that he has a gun to the back of his head. He's, he's got to double every like two or three months in terms of sales. So it's, you know, a big like thing we haven't talked about is like, why the fuck would we raise? We have freedom. Like, yes, we're working like dogs, but sh like, you know, Shannon and I do what the fuck we want. Like we work hard, but like if we have to take a day off or we decide for a month that we want to do something totally different, like we're in control. When you have an investor, particularly if they've invested a, a lot of money, they have a strong opinion and they have a right to wield it. And so they can force us to grow. So 10% is very slow for investors. They're going to want 20, 25%. So even if we crank it to 10, Shannon, when, as yeah. soon as that money hits our bank account, within a month or two, they're going to be like, why isn't it 15? Why isn't it 20? Why isn't it 25? And if within three months we haven't ramped up to 25, then we're doing something wrong. Yep. Well, I and think like we, we've done similar growth like we've done higher monthly growth so like we can do it and we can show them we can do it but i think we need to hold our guns with the fact that like we don't believe in growing and sustainably you know what i mean i do I so the hard go ahead michael sorry i was just gonna say if we're aiming for the 50k a month in product revenue then to get to that point it would take if we did grow a 10 percent month over month it would take us about four months to get there anyways so like if we're looking at this in five or six months time, like I Sorry, you're talking about GMV. Yeah. GMV. Yeah, yeah. Not like, like for the 32 K, if we want to get that to 50, we're going to have to grow between like 7.5 and 10% a month anyways. So I feel like 
it's not a question of if, if it's like possible. It's just like, I feel like if that's our goal, like we're going to have to do that anyways to be able to get to that point. Cool. I'm for sure going to tell this story for the record. Like I'm not going to present it like this in the investor deck. I'm going to tell this story, which is whatever Shannon's putting in plus what brands are putting in is the answer. Like I'm not even going to give it as an option. It's just like, yeah, that's, that's our GMB because it is. Yeah. And if they want to poke at it, so be it. And I think I can hold my ground, but if they poke and poke and poke and I have to drop down and be like, okay, fine. We won't count Shannon's revenue. I still want the number to be impressive. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's a good goal. And then our upside is that thanks to Shannon, we're 20 or 30 K higher than that. Yeah. But yeah, I think a good goal would be like 50 K of GMV. Agreed. But, but two, two warring things guys are like, you know, this can be top of funnel growth, Tiffany, which means like new people, net new, which is sort of Michael's job, like people that have never heard of us before coming in. But it can also be, and I would way prefer it to be, frankly, customers that have used us already using us a lot. So something we've talked a lot about, and I really want to bake into this investor deck, guys, is like changing the norm. We have this internal expectation, which starts in my brain and has gone systemic, unfortunately, that like we're lucky when a brand wants to post a job with us. Like that's victory. And I think what, we're, what we want is a brand to use us as their content source. So Tiffany, a big thing for you is like the norm should be 10 to 20 shoots a year for a company. And the aberration should be a company trying us once and being like, thanks, and doing like a one-off shoot. And if that's the case, Michael, then a lot of this GMB will come from repeat business as opposed to having to crank the top of the funnel. So I think you and Tiffany together can, like, I don't know that you need to put the pedal to the metal and find a way to grow us twice as fast as we're growing simply by cranking the top of our funnel. On the contrary, I would prefer, you know, the pace that you've set, like we all felt that lurch forward when you started doing sales last month, that pace that you set, I want to keep it, maybe increase it a little bit, but then I want the Delta to be picked up by Tiffany and building lifetime value. And the story that I really want to tell Shannon, which I, I think like, so the wrong investor won't attract them. And this goes for love. It goes for anything. Like some investors are only going to care about top of funnel metrics, 10% growth. Like how fast are you growing? How fast are you selling? But smart investors care about business fundamentals. And like, I've learned the hard way as you have Shannon, like the importance of the base and the base Tiffany is this, like it's the most important thing. Like if we do not have liquidity, if we don't have really happy creators, really happy brands, if we don't have product market fit resoundingly, then the growth is just nonsense. It's just money we're pouring in the top. And a talk track that Shannon knows, because I say it all the time and also just sent her Kamath Palahapatiya talking about this, but like 40 cents out of every investor dollar goes to Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Translation, you raise money, you pump money into Facebook, Google, and Amazon to acquire customers. You lose money on those acquisitions. And then you raise more money to cover those losses. And it's just kicking the can down the road. It's a Ponzi scheme. It really is. It's like, that's not conspiratorial. That's like how it works. And that's why there's this article, um, Warby Parker clones. So you guys should read this. I'll put it in the chat, I guess, or I'll email it to you guys. Um, so this, you see the like Casper Harry's Outdoor Voices Away. Are you familiar with these brands, Tiffany? Yes. Away, am I, I don't know if I'm confusing Away it with another. Away I feel like it. they had a scandal, if I recall. They fucking I don't know. suck, man. I, I, I met the two founders pretty early on, and they're just the shittiest people in the whole world which I'm very happy to say on this public thing that I'm recording because they should know how much they suck. This girl was like poster child. I went to Forbes 30 under 30 and this chick like gave the keynote. Her name is Ty, Tyler. And she's just like a boss lady. Like I was like, wow. Like I was so impressed by her. She stood up this like athleisure company that was like a cooler Lululemon called Outdoor Voices. 
but like this whole article that I'll send you guys is about how literally all of these things just crank took, you know, amazing. Like, look at this outdoor voices was hemorrhaging $2 million a month last year on annual sales of 40 million. So they were net loss, 24, 24 million fucking dollars a year on four, 40 million of gross sales. So their operating cost was 64 million and their gross revenue is 40. So they're just did a collab with them. <laughs> what? Body hype did a collaboration with them. The other dance group. I've been Are you body, body, body and DZAC? No, I just have friends in both. So I know that they did that, but we actually have a Lululemon sponsorship. So anyways, continue. Really? Shut up. Um, My friends love actor voices. That's all I'll say. But it's, but it's dead in the water. Like it's going to go out of business pretty soon. Um, because of this exact phenomena of like growing unsustainably. So I'm totally with Shannon that like, we've got to push back and hold our ground. And like during this raise, Shannon, if we do it, I think there'll be investors that like, if we say we're growing 5% month over month, that'll be a non-starter for them and they won't be interested. And I think we just have to be a little bit more confident this time around and be like, that's cool. Like we're really focused on like liquidity. We're really focused on our lifetime value. We feel like we built a really strong base. Like growth hasn't been our priority yet. And like, to the right investor, that'll be music to his or her ears because we're building for long-term health. And to the wrong investor, that'll be like, what do you mean you're not growing? Like I invest in high growth companies. Yeah, and I think that's our answer right there. Like for everything, like never get in bed with the wrong investor ever. (laughs) Right. So we have no worries if we're not aiming for them, you know? And the cool thing about this is like, we are sustainable right now. Like we, we, we're profitable. The question is like, is it sustainable for you and me, Shannon? And this will be an out, this will be an option, but we don't have to take it. And that's the cool about the position of where we're at, which is that like, if we were losing hundred K a month, we would need to raise or sell period, which is where we were at before COVID. But we're now at this point where it's like, we can do what the fuck we want. Like we can raise if we want, we can not raise if we want, we can sell in six months. Like we're in the driver's seat. And I think so long as we don't lose sight of that, And, you know, it's like dating, right? Like if you, if you feel happy with yourself and you're like, I don't need anyone else. You don't need to do things too fast. You don't need to become codependent. You just do your own thing. You do your own thing, man. And if you're, if you're like insecure and you want someone else to fill your soul, which I think both Shannon and I have done during this company, then you end up like getting in bed quite literally with someone who you become codependent with. So we definitely need to avoid that for sure. Um, cool. You guys want to jump into it? Yeah. Okay. We could go from the top. Um, this is, I, I just copied this from Sequoia. Um, the client I was just talking about that, like I really have been enjoying working with, they were in Sequoia's incubator. Tiffany Sequoia's in Silicon Valley. It's one of the preeminent, um, VCs sort of like one of the top three, maybe. Um, so Sequoia basically is like, this is the deck that we like to see. So I just like using it because I also think it flows nicely and makes sense. So this would be just like a sentence or like short paragraph about what we are and why we exist. It could be something as simple as like the hub connects quality focused food and beverage brands to photographers and videographers. One thing that we haven't included in this page in the past that I think is really important, like now than ever is like the whole, um, you know, paying creators type thing, like creating right. jobs, blah, blah, blah. Like that's, everyone wants creative jobs right now. So. So that's the beauty of a deck like this. And that's a fucking awesome point, Shannon. Like, and by the way, like the guy I'm going to show this to first, this guy, Adriel, that Shannon and I got dinner with right before COVID. He's a really brilliant investor and he specializes in marketplaces. So I'm really excited to hear his thoughts once we finish this, but he's a big believer as am I in the future of work even more so now that COVID's hit, the future of work, Tiffany, is like what we're all doing, like working remote, a lot of freelancers. Our designer that designed our logo and all of our software, who's utterly talented, her name's Brielle. I hired her for 55K and she ratcheted me up to 110K by the time she quit. And then she quit. And I was kind of pissed because I'm like, we're a tiny ass company. I'm paying you 110K and you're still going to motherfucking quit but she wanted to go out on her own. She charges a hundred bucks an hour. She has like five clients at a time. 
no problem finding clients. She makes 200K a year. Her boyfriend was one of our developers. They met on the job. And they travel the world and they both work freelance for clients and they both make two, 300K a year. It's like, what? Like they're living the dream. So Shannon, I agree with your point that like the future of work, that's a certain kind of investor. It's a certain kind of investment strategy, but this could be a future of work slide. So instead of just generically describing what we do, we could be like, our mission is to, you know, create an economy where, where young photographers can make a living, you know, by working with high quality focus brands. Yeah. And that's like a totally different way to set the tone for this deck than what I just said. Yep. So just so we move through this fairly quickly, I'm just going to like take notes maybe, and maybe some of the slides um, we can but instead of workshopping language, I'm just going to say like, do we want this to be future of work, which I think is a really interesting way in Shannon. So if that's the case, if, if this is about the future of work, that will set up, there's this very common one, two punch Tiffany problem solution that investors like to see what's the problem you're solving. What's your solution for it? If we led with like, we connect brands to creators, the problem would be like, Content is like harder than ever to create. It's like da 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 da. But if it's a future of work thing, Shannon, then the then the um, problem might be like, you know. Isn't it possible to have like multiple purposes though? Yes, but in my experience, like you want to tell a very tight story. Like you don't want to you don't want to create like because the whole thing is we're creating a thread. Like this is our purpose. This is the problem getting in our way. This is our solution for it. And if you have like three purposes and three problems and three solutions, it's just like, it's hard to, it's hard. I need to be able to go in there and fucking pound, like, like just hit this sales pitch so fucking hard, like so tight. And if it's. Well, what if it starts at our, the issue we're, we're solving is the purpose is we want to decentralize the millions of dollars worth of work that go into agencies to empower creators or, and help young brands grow. And then that splits off into the two problems of future of work for creators and, uh, keeping up with content for brands, you know, Michael, look at that with a little emoji usage. Love that for you. I'm obsessed with this work from brands and yeah, I like that. Look, Shannon. I just, I don't think we can talk about them in like one stream of one problem because there are two completely separate problems that are meeting very hard. Okay. Well, the cool thing about this shell is that we can totally change it. So check this out, Shannon. We can, we can do this. We can go brand problem, creator problem. So brand demand problem, creator supply problem. We can say, so our purpose, as you said, I'm just, I'm going to write it in really shorthand is like, um, decentralize brand and agency creative work to millions of talented creators. And we can workshop the language of course later, but like that's, that's more or less what you said, right? Yep. Um, and then so I like that a lot. And then it's like, cool. So the purpose is we want to decentralize all this money that's going into like that is being spent by brands and agencies to the millions of talented creators that exist. Um, and the- we could even like use to our advantage, like a lot of brands look at the problem from both sides as the same problem, but they're not, they're very often like similar, but you have to. What do you build- mean by that? Like the brand problem and the creator problem are related, but they're both very separate issues that you have to like, like exactly what we're doing. We're loving the photographers and we're loving the brands. We're doing them both in very different ways, but similar ways. Yes. You know? Wouldn't you agree that ultimately though, the, their salvation lies in the same simple fact? Yes, but I, I think that's the issue. A lot of people don't talk about the differences in their problems or care about the differences in their problems, though they may be like minuscule. I think that's our differentiator. Okay, so explain that to me. Just what do you view as the differences? Well, I'm just saying that's why I want to list the two different problems. Like, I'm, you know what I mean? 
Like I'm yeah, not. Yeah, but I'm just curious. What do you view as the different? Like, if what what do you see as the the problem for brands? If you had to pick one, and what do you see as the problem for creators? The problem for brands is they're being overcharged and they're being overwhelmed with options, um, and there's no good answer for them. So, like, they could find a photographer. They could pay anyone. They could pay an agency. They could pay a freelancer. Like, we're not really like reinventing the wheel per se um or just making it easier for them and then the creators like same thing they could get work elsewhere but we are like just creating new job opportunities so i have a couple thoughts one those are three brand problems so we're gonna have to pick one right like yeah. um overpaying you said which i actually don't think is the problem I think, I think it's more overwhelm and Michael, yep. I'll be interested to hear what you think too. Like, I, I think it's like, it's, it's almost paralysis. It's like, again, it's yeah. like, um, w like we always say, right. It, it could be their friend from college. It could be some influencer they find online. It could be some agent. Like they, like there are so many options, but they're poorly presented. In other words, there's no, like, there's no menu. There's no like centralized place where it's like, this is what it, this is what your options are and what you get for it. It's sort of like you go onto Instagram and you DM some info, you know, shitty influencer. You call your buddy up who like you think has a camera and maybe studied this like in high school or something. You call an agency and they're like, yeah, it's $15,000 a month. So there, there are options, but they're not, they're all kind of shitty and none of them are consolidated under one roof. They're all very separate entities. And so when we get on sales calls and Michael, you know, this better than I do, probably, you know, people are coming to us from, I spent way too much money with an agency and they're doing shitty work. We talk to people that are like, we're growing really fast. And, you know, Becky, who's been, you know, shooting in house for us just is ain't cutting it anymore. We talk to people that are like, yeah, we like have been doing a lot of UGC like influencer stuff, but it's not really like that high quality. So there are a lot of like pain points. But to me, there, I think you're hitting something with like the overwhelm, the sort of, or, or overwhelm, underwhelm. Like there are too many options. And so there's sort of a paralysis therein of like, where do I start? How, like, how do I do this? There isn't like an easy way to just figure this out. Yep. It's sort yeah, of like, Airbnb, it's sort of like Airbnb, right? Like before Airbnb, it's like, there are hotels, there are individualized websites for bed and breakfast. Like there are options. It wasn't that there weren't options. It's just like, there's not one place that makes it super easy. And so if you're going to fucking Nashville and you want to like find a place to stay, you're going to have to call each individual hotel or go into Expedia, I guess, or call each individual Airbnb or, or bed and breakfast. But there wasn't one place where you could go and just see everything and all the ratings and all the photos and it's standardized and it's easy. And like, that's what we're doing. I agree. I think the root of all of these problems that we solve is that the fact that they're overwhelmed because like I think a lot of brands, especially growing brands, feel overwhelmed by like where to create content. So they just go to the agencies because it's like reliable, quote unquote, because it's more expensive and like they just don't know better. So then as a, as a result, they overpay. So I feel like the root of all the problems we solve is like overwhelmed. Okay. And so overwhelmed, they're bad options and there are too many of them. So you're either overpaying to an agency, you're not getting quality if you're working with your buddy Fred, you're not getting quality from the influencer and you might also be overcharged. So like getting a fair price, getting good, it's the triangle we always talk about, like better, faster, cheaper, like getting really high quality work that's relatively fast and relatively affordable. Like there isn't a, a centralized marketplace for that and that's what we're creating, right? So the brand problem is overwhelmed, bad options, and too many of them. The creator problem is um, talented, but too noisy, hard to break through, find work, consistent living. Yeah, also, it might be interesting to like speak to rebuilding the industry of content. Like it's so fucked right now that people like you know jenny b and weekend creative are pissed because they're not getting 5k but we know that doesn't exist anymore you know that's what i find so fascinating i don't want to derail us too much because i have to go at 11 but for those of you who don't know that uh, this this chick was like chirping us last night like she just was 
she went off on Instagram about how we're taking advantage of creators and all of this stuff. And it, it was filled with misinformation, but directionally, it's something we've heard a lot, even from our top creators, not quite as antagonistically, but people have said again and again and again, like, you know, the worth of creators, the worth of creators. And there's this huge chip on their shoulder that they're not being paid enough. They're being devalued. And it's like, yes, unfortunately, that's where the market is. Need I remind you, when people were making $10,000 a shoot, that was going into Vogue for a month or a billboard for three months. And by the way, the photographer was shooting on film and had a whole bunch of extra costs and was shooting in a, sh a studio with Apple boxes and assistants and lights and fans. Like I've been on those sets. I know what a $10,000 day rate looks like. And what you're shooting with your mirrorless digital camera that you bang out in three hours, like they think that they're so special and so evolved, but the reality is like, they're moving light years, light speed faster than the guy who made the $10,000 day rate 10 years ago. Oh, and by the way, their images aren't going to end up in vogue for a month. Their images are going to end up on a Facebook ad for two days until it's replaced with another one or on an Instagram feed, which by the way is dead and organic social, as you guys have all heard me say many times is dead. And it's going to be buried in three, you know, three to six to nine days by other photos. So the life cycle of a photo is so short and it's easier to make. So wouldn't it then make sense that a photo costs 5X less than it did 10 years ago? That's not a devaluing so much as it's just an adjustment of, of like technology. It's an evolution. And like to me, the fact that we have this goal that I think will hit of like our top photographers in the coming year making $60,000 like and in, well, in two, that three could be even the larger scale problem is the adjustment to technology within the content space. Like no one's owning that. Like that's the problem. I don't know that art, I don't, so maybe it does. It's, it's a more nuanced conversation. Like it requires a deep understanding as you obviously have of the space, Shannon, but to like the untrained investor explaining that like, there's a wild west of content and it hasn't been priced correctly. And there's a market correction coming where it needs to be repriced, which is sort of what you're saying. And that we want to stick our flag in the ground as like the marketplace. Like we price just like Airbnb has like a, this is what, you know, they've, they've set a rate in Nashville, right? Like when you post your listing in Nashville, they're like, this is what other similar listings are going for. And they tell you exactly what you're worth. And then the market will respond like people will or will not book. And they've like, they've established like a new normal, which is by the way, half the cost of a hotel. So a hotel could be like, this is bullshit. Like, don't you know how much rooms cost? Like it should be $500 a night. And Airbnb is like, well, actually, no, it's 250 bucks a night. And that's the going rate. Um, so anyway, I think it's, I think it's a really smart point and certainly one we should talk to in our content work that we're doing in the future. But I, like, I don't know, do you think an investor can wrap his or her head around like there isn't standardization in this industry and what we're setting out to do is to standardize pricing so that both photographers and brands feel like they're getting value. Photographers are getting affordable content that's high quality and photographers are making a living. Do you think that's uh, our story? I mean, I think it, the most high level sense that is the truth of it. Okay. So you don't see the problem is it's too noisy and it's hard to break through and make a living. You see the problems are like there's overwhelmed bad options and too many of them, no standardized pricing or marketplace for content yep and the creator problem is I, I would love michael's thoughts what do you think michael i was just gonna say i feel like this might be a result of kind of like what happened yesterday and last night and that like that entire instagram rant kind of like derailed our thinking on this a little bit and i feel like this is honestly a little bit like off track of like who we are and like what our focus is i feel like we don't need to go into the details and like explain on a really high level that there's this like lack of standardization or like how costs have changed of content creation. I feel like we can just focus it and keep it tightened on like who our creators are and the fact that like we're empowering them in a financial and a creative sense. But that's just my take. 
yeah, my thoughts with it are that just like we can say that we're empowering them like financially, whatever, and bringing them work, but like the so are, so are all the other competitors, right? Like so is Snapper, and so yeah. is like whatever. So I think our differentiator is we're actually setting like a real price model that's sustainable. So mm -hmm. I think I think like these are the three words that come to mind just listening to you guys speak. Centralization is a big thing, right? Like Airbnb works because I don't have to go to these websites of bed and breakfast or like seven different hotels. I go to one place. It's centralized. Mm -hmm. Just like I don't want to have to like go to Instagram and then go to fucking, you know, like four or five other places to find a decent photographer and like even on Instagram, if I put a gun to even Shannon's head, who's fucking good at this. And I'm like, I need a really good photographer in Oregon tomorrow. It would take her like 26 minutes to find the, a good person. Right. On Instagram, like even, even now, even today. So centralizing it's big for me. Standardizing it is what I'm hearing from you, Shannon. So like, what does it cost? Like, what, what do you get for a shoot? Like, what is this industry? Like, this is the wild West. Like, how do you get content in 2020? We're standardizing that. And then like some semblance of symbiosis, meaning both sides feel like they're winning, right? Like my goal would be that fucking Jenny, you know, that like photographers, the, the ones that are loyal to us are really grateful because again, they're making, there's a world in which photographers make 75 to 125K a year on our platform and brands get really awesome, affordable content for a grand to shoot. Like, we're working towards some sort of a steady state. And I know we kind of go back and forth on this, you and I, Shannon, about like moving the bar up too high. But I think there's some steady state. I'm just going to throw a random stake in the ground, like a thousand bucks a shoot and judge does a hundred of them a year. Or, or I guess 118 of them a year. And so by doing 118, we take our 18%. Judge makes 100K. And brands get one of the best photographers in the country to do a shoot for her, for them, for a grand. And in my opinion, both sides should walk away from that being like, wow, I didn't spend five grand on this bullshit agency. Yeah. And the creator, instead of bitching about, I only made a grand a shoot, should be like, wow, I only worked a hundred days this year. And like, I get that there's pre-pro and post-pro post and all this stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, I worked, I worked a hundred days this year and I made a hundred fucking grand as a photographer. Like to me, that, that steady state is unbelievable. And I think that's achievable for our top 20 in like the next couple of years. And I think that's achievable for like tens of thousands of people if this goes well in the next five years. Yeah, and that's why I keep coming back to this like standardizing, well, not, not standardizing, I still love like the bidding structure and like everyone has their own rate thing, but coming back to like standardizing the standardizing the market and all of that like that's the issue michael's trying to figure out with brands every day he's always trying to convince them like you need to move your budget up to 750 or a thousand and then we're you and i are trying to convince the top 20 like you guys need to bring your budget down to 1500 so like it all comes back to the like convincing people the price is correct because you and i know what it's worth but the brand doesn't know what it's worth and the photographer doesn't know what it's worth so it's like standardizing the new cost of shoots. I agree. Yeah. And if we're working towards becoming the new red antler for content, then like we can achieve that just by like achieving market dominance and like centralizing content creation as a whole. Yeah, we just put a fucking stake in the ground, right? It's like, this is who we are. This is what content costs in 2020. And if we were 10 times the size we are, we could do that tomorrow, right? We could just be like, this is what it is. And everyone would be like, okay, this is what it is, right? It's not like people are like, I don't know. I think Airbnb is unfair. Airbnb prices the fucking market. It's not like you get into an Uber and you're like, I don't know, like six bucks is kind of all, it's like, well, I mean, maybe you check Lyft, but it's going to be a dollar or two different. Like that's the price of the market right now. That's like what the market is because Uber said so. So you just fucking do it, right? Like if you're like, maybe, maybe people, I, not, no one I know, and maybe it's because I know, you know, bougie Princeton kids, but no one I know like is, makes the decision that they're going to take an Uber or a Lyft somewhere sees the price and then it's like never mind i'll just walk or i'll like do something oh, else i do that all the time oh really like, well. <laughs> but more, is that more or less it's like that's that's if you want to take a car from point a to point b uber tells you what it costs and you either say yes or no but there's no like 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe it's not a good analogy, but I just, I think that we have the opportunity as you're sort of saying, Shannon, to like become the standard, right? So it seems like we need to tighten this because there too, there's too much in here and I don't want to waste all of our time on these slides, but you know, there's overwhelm, there are bad options and too many of them, and there's no standardized pricing or marketplace for content. So those are sort of different things. And so I think we should tighten this, but it's something around that. And then on the creator side, it's like, you know, the creator may well be talented, but it's too noisy. It's hard to break through and find work and make a consistent living. And then again, I guess this idea of like lack of standardization and, you know. Also, like, there's no formal vetting, right? Like that's another, I don't know if this is going too deep, but that's another thing with Airbnb, right? I could find somebody in Austin, Texas who will let me go stay at their house, but that's fucking weird and creepy. But Airbnb has vetted this person. They said they're a super host. And now I feel completely comfortable flying to Austin, Texas and living in a stranger's home. Agreed. And kind of along those lines, kind of what we were talking about with the pricing of Uber, people are accepting that price and they're not blaming it on Uber. They're blaming it on the market. And that's because they define the market. So I feel like this is in that same vein of thought. Yeah. So we need to tighten it. If that's really what it comes down to, Shannon, then maybe like, maybe that's our story, right? Is that like, maybe instead of overwhelm bad options and too many of them, it's like, there's no standard pricing or, or like Mark, like there's no agreed upon place of where to get content, how much it costs, what you get in return. That's the problem for brands. And the problem for creators is that there's lack of standardization and structure around finding work. So creators are like, I don't fucking know like where to find work, what to charge, how to charge, if they're going to pay me on time, da, da, da. And brands are like, I don't know how to find good, consistent content. What does a like, photo shoot cost? Like, how the fuck do I pay them? Like, right. Like I found some like idiot on, on, like, it's like you said, right? Like you can find someone in Austin, Texas to let you stay there. You can find some creator like, and like send them some contract and hope it works out. But as we've experienced when shit hits the fan and goes sideways, having that center, having that trusted source in between that can reverse funds and escrow or kick someone off a platform, like Uber, Airbnb, like they standardize that, like, like, the fact that you trust that software layer chain enough to like get in a car with a strange man at two in the morning in an Uber or like go and stay at some random stranger's house in Austin, Texas, you know, like that's, inc that's an incredibly powerful statement about what that, what their trust mechanisms do for you. Yeah. And even though I like, it, it's like people have bad experiences on our platform, but I hear about girls getting like raped in Ubers and you know what, I'm still going to call an Uber at two in the morning because Uber is the fucking market. You right. Know? So then the solution is something like, you know, standardized marketplace. Brands get quality work or get images better, faster, and cheaper than anywhere else. Creators get consistent work at fair market pricing, something like that. Why now? So I think that it, 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 this is interesting, Shannon, like you've taken us in a really interesting direction. Like why now we probably have like three things yep. and we'd say some, it's some arc of a story like um, content is everywhere. This is like where my like 11.4 images before making a purchase decision. Yep. Which, mine actually told me that's gone up now. Someone said it was like closer to 18 now. So we should look into that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, all of this is bullshit. So we just need to like fit, fix it with stuff that actually makes sense. But like contents everywhere, choice paradox, too many choices, no standardization. And then could third be like creating millions of jobs in this global pandemic? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's like future of work, other industries. So I think maybe it's something, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's something like content's fucking everywhere. Despite the fact that it's everywhere and everyone needs it, there's no clean way to get it. And there's this thing, the future of work where like, people hire freelancers like 
you hire a freelance driver to be your Uber driver. You hire like a freelance hotelier to be your Airbnb host. Like we hire freelance people to do our accounting, our legal, like the future of work is a decentralized future where you find people with different skill sets on the internet and very efficiently get matched with them instead of having to weed through the fire hose of information on Google and hope that you find the right person. And then once you do trusting them, even though you have no reason to, this is like, yeah, and I mean, this is how we, we date. This is how we do anything. So why shouldn't it exist for us? Right. You know? Other industries, how we date, how we travel, how we stay, now content. So why now is like content's fucking everywhere. Everyone needs it. Unfortunately, like there are too many choices. They're bad choices. There's no standardization. And every other industry has figured out how to do this, right? Like, I don't like go on to Instagram and DM chicks to like find dates. I go on to like hinge, right? I don't like go on to Instagram and DM some nice looking house and be like, or, or, or ooh, like, I don't like stand on the side of the road and be like, Hey, it looks like you have some extra space in your car. I'll pay you 20 <laughs> bucks. Right? Like all of these places have used a platform to build trust and standardization around what it costs for a ride or what it costs for a night to stay or what it costs, you know, or like, you know, the processes around dating and the fact that you Shannon, like a young woman would feel comfortable going to a bar in Brooklyn, New York with a complete stranger because you went through Tinder or hinge. The fact that you get into a car, the fact that you'd stay in someone's house, like it speaks volumes to this trust thing yeah. and supply and demand through this software can find a price or an agreed upon set of circumstances that they both feel comfortable with and that they trust because of the software. Yeah, and I think that's our main differentiator with all of our competition is no one has trust. Love that. Good stuff, Shannon. Doing good today. Uh, what's that? Doing good today. That's good. You lower, you lower the Lex? I haven't even taken it today yet, so maybe that's it. <laughs> that's it. I'm telling you, man, lower. Yeah. Lower. Uh, Mark? Under like, why now? I don't know if this fits into there, but like with COVID, there is a distinct issue of like in person and like basically like needing someone in the same place. Um, and like, I feel like we have a particular advantage in like being able to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. like the future work may never go back to how we knew it. So yeah, I want to be careful with that because I feel like everyone's going to be harping on that right now. Not that it's not true, but yeah. also remember that this is our February 2021 deck. So, okay. you know, like, we can hit that when we get to February and if the world is still closed down, we'll write it. Yeah. My, my hope, my guess, my assumption is that there's going to be like a vaccine that's either out or very close to being out. And like, people will be like, it's about to get back to normal. So maybe we have this, maybe we build the slide like this and we have like a little thing down here, like, and also COVID. Um, but I don't think it should be a main point. Market size. Um, so this is like often called a TAM slide. This, I think we could really use your help, either Tiffany or Michael. It's my least favorite slide in an investor deck because it's such bullshit. And I always try to make it not bullshit because otherwise it's just a throwaway slide. Usually what people do are like, you know, this is how many brands there are. Or like, this is how many consumers there are in America. Like there are 200 million people that shopped online last year. On average, they need to see 18 pieces of content. So if you multiply 200 million by 18, you get like whatever that comes out to, 6 billion pieces of content that need to be created. You know, so you just sort of build a story of like how big this is and how big it could get. You know, the average shoot is 10 images and costs this much money, or like the average image on our platform costs $75. So I'll just kind of bullshit it for now. I'll be like, how many e-com, like, so I'll just say like 200 million e-com customers. Then I'll say, you know, 18 images per customer. Then I'll say, go ahead. Then I'll say um, 200 million e-com customers, 18 images per customer. Then I'll say, um, you know, so that comes out to whatever that math comes out to, like 6 billion images needed. 
and we could build this any which way, Michael. I might just like give you this slide to make it cool, but that would mean. Would it be interesting to add like money that has been spent at advertising agencies, like on content? Yeah, like... totally. I mean, like there's a lot of ways we could build this. So you could be like advertising agencies, you know, like, like the content spend in 2020 was this, um, you know, that's split into, so you could say like, you know, whatever, $15 billion of content spend. You could say that's split into, into two things, which is like, you know, I don't know, 10 billion is agency and 5 billion is brand direct. Then you go into, you know, if we were to get 2% of this market and like, 5% of this market that would yield like this much revenue would for us. Interesting but to show like, um, cause we did roughly, uh, it's like 600 shoots we did in a year for 600 different brands or whatever on the platform. Could we technically like show the math of how much it would cost an agency to shoot for 600 brands on average and then put that number versus how much money we made in a year or like how much money we did in shoots in a year. Cause that number I feel would be like huge. Yeah, I can like run our numbers and like do some data analysis and like basically put this in a visually appealing format that like puts that comparison in there, if that would be helpful. Yeah, I think that's a different slide. Um, that would come like after competition. So it'd be like, yeah, it'd be like, um, you know, us versus agencies. I don't, I have to think more about that Shannon because that, that could reflect really well on us. Like there's look at all the upside or something like that, or it could reflect sort of badly on us that like we're cheap or undervalued or something. But I, I think you're right. I think it's like, I think the whole point is to be cheap though. Right? Like, and yeah, we could so even put like, snapper below it where it shows they did 600 shoots but they only made you know a tiny fraction of what we made they paid creators a tiny fraction of what we paid yeah that could be kind of interesting right so you could say like you could say agencies typical agency the hub the hub suna yeah. And so Michael, what we could say is like, you know, Well, in a typical agency, they don't do 600 shoots in a year, right? Year we did 600 shoots for 600 brands. And by the way, this, this won't be true. So I want this to be like a thousand. So like, that's another thing. So what, what we should do, by the way, when we're telling this story, we should do another session like this, cause I'm going to have to go in 13 minutes, but you know, what I want to do, Shannon is like actually put some numbers in like this and then we can highlight all of these things in a deck and like some of them we can kill and say not important but remember this is going to be six months from now yep. so when we're looking back retrospectively and we say in the past 12 months how many shoots did we do my hope would be that we will have done yep. more than than 600 um, but in any case thousand shoots thousand brands you know typical agency you know i'm making this up now like whatever seven thousand dollars per shoot so, you know, equals, um, what is that, $7 million? Yeah, and that's across, you know, way less brands and way less shoots. So it's way less productive or efficient. Yeah, I think we need to make one point with this slide, which is the one you're making, which is that like Suna does, um, you know, $39 a photo. So like $400 per shoot. And that equals, uh, you know, $400,000 and then we do a thousand dollars per shoot and that equals $1 million. And like the point that we'd make is like, it takes the agency how long to make that 7 million compared to it takes us like, yeah, we gotta be careful and not make too many points expensive. Well, that's the point is like, 
they didn't do a thousand shoots last year, you know? Yeah. So they didn't shoot for a thousand brands. Well, the main point, at least as I understood when you first started saying it, sweet spot. Well, like you can't multiply 7,000 per shoot to get 7 million because they didn't do a thousand brands last year, you know? Okay. So the first point I thought you were trying to make is that they overcharge, right? So like the, like one point we could make with this is that like, this is ridiculously expensive. So in a world where like a brand or brands were to pay an agency, you know, to do a thousand shoots, you know, they're paying $7 million soon as like the cheap ass option we're a lot cheaper but we're better than suna and like this is the sweet spot and so we're telling a story of like too expensive too cheap goldilocks but if you wanted i guess we could do some sort of a matrix where it's like it's like this it's like cost time you know and um quality and we could do this and we could do something like this where we say like time would be like an average shoot it takes two weeks so a thousand shoot would be you know two thousand weeks yep and then say not possible in one year Right? Yep. And then we'll say 52 weeks, 52 weeks. So the point we're making here is that agencies are way too expensive, way too much time. You know, maybe we just make it about cost and time. Yeah. Like quality, like we could like put a, I don't know how we would want to quantify that. Like we can't really say like, we could say high, medium, high. Yeah. Well, also like agencies, I don't know if this is getting too deep, but they're not keeping up with like the trends and like the market and how things are changing, you know, as much as they should be. So maybe it's that. And then maybe we don't pick Suna. Maybe we pick Snapper. Yeah. Or however you spell it. And this is low. Yeah. Um, Fiverr just because it's a very like recognizable like garbage organization. <laughs> Fiverr? Yeah. Like all the brands Fiverr I talked to. Fiverr so are... low quality. Yeah. So like, so this is sort of interesting. And like, these are slides that you could really help with Michael. So we have, we have sort of a matrix of like agency, the hub Fiverr and like cost. And we need to like express somehow that like, this is really fucking expensive. This is really fucking cheap. We're the middle ground. We can pull off a thousand shoots in 52 weeks. Fiverr can do it in 52 weeks. And the typical agency can do it in 2000 weeks. So oh. way too expensive, way too long, and the quality is oh, so, so. So obviously this is a shitty option. And by the way, even though this is only a thousand shoots this year, we can scale to as many shoots as we possibly need. Right. And that's lost on this slide. So like the 52 weeks is a little bit like inaccurate insofar as like we could do a thousand shoots in two weeks in theory, right? Because we could have them all yeah. happening concurrently. Um, Maybe we change it from time then to like a limit. So like a typical agency in a year can do how many shoots Fiverr can do. I guess like, I don't know how many shoots they can do unlimited as well, but like we have like the skies are limit. Like we can do as many shoots as we can. Right. So maybe, maybe they can do like 20 to 30 shoots. Right. And we can do like infinity scalable infinite scalable infinitely scalable so something like that I think we also want to have a competition slide and this one this one will be very interesting which is like um, the, the classic thing you see on these slides are like double matrix or like a whatever what I don't know whatever the fuck you call it Michael you probably know what it's called um, 
So we create something like this. And we do something with, you know, two different spectrum. High quality, low quality. Um, low scale, high scale, I'm making this up, you know, and so like this would end up being the hub. This would end up being Suna, Snapper, other platforms, Fiverr. I think it's also good to kind of list those because it shows that there's a lot of really low quality platforms, but we really are the only high quality. No, no, so like what, what you do is you have the logos of all of them, right? So we would have like 15 logos and we'd map them all on this thing. I'm just sort of saying like roughly how it will end up. Totally. The low quality, low scale would be like, I don't know, like shitty agency, I guess, or, or like friend friend who's a photographer, influencer <laughs> friend who is photographer. And then high quality, low scale will be like um, good agencies, right? And we and and this is a spectrum, Michael. So again, what this will actually look like is you'll have like different things kind of graphed like this. So there'll be agencies that are like very high quality, and probably what you'll see is some sort of a distribution, guys, like this, where like there's some sort of correlation between quality and scale. So like the higher the quality, the lower the scale and the, the higher the scale, the lower the quality. So like there'll be agencies like that. So right. And then the same thing with, with, um, this so like there will be um really high scale low quality like fiber might be up here and snapper soon as like pretty high quality actually so i'd say like they're here you know like who are we most threatened by and so we'll have you know we'll have people that are sort of like this and then we'll have shitty agency friends like we'll have a whole bunch of stuff down here and I would almost like not even put us at the most high quality point because there's always going to be amazing agencies. We're not going to kill them all, right? Like, I think it's important to be like realistic where we actually stand. Yeah, I mean, conventional wisdom is like you do want your logo to just sit kind of like comfortably right here in the middle. It doesn't really matter exactly where it is, but like the this is like a very tried and true investor side where you're basically like, this is where the competition sits and this is why we're different because there's no one that's high scale and quite high quality and that's us. There are people that are high scale, but they're kind of mostly lower quality. There are people that are high quality, but no scale. There are people that are low on both fronts, but we're the only one that's both. And so, yeah, you're right, Shannon. Like we could, we could put us like here or something, but mostly yeah. I would just kind of plop us in the middle and it's just sort of a tried and true of like, we own this quadrant. This is our white space. No one else has high scale and high quality. Yep. And we, and like, if we want to be realistic, we can have people sort of infringing on our space like this. Yeah. But like more or less it's, we own this. Yep. And then we have like this, which is like, and this is how we compare to like the typical agency and the typical platform, typical platform, parentheses, Fiverr. And then typical agency parentheses, like, I don't really care what it is, but like, you know, VML, YNR. And that's basically just taking someone from here and taking someone from here and picking on them and being like, yeah, this is uh, decently high quality, like middle of the road quality, but no scale. This is decent scale, but not the best quality. And we interesting because our domain expertise comes from this and this world so we've lived 
in both entities already. Right. Yeah. Like I come from here, right? Yeah. And like you understand like the like photographer's photography. perspective. And like that's our that's our story, right? And so like there's a, a slide, Shane, in where it's like team. And so this is where we'll like have like you, me, and like Jason, and we'll be like, your domain expertise is photography and production. My expertise is brands and agency and Jason's expertise is software. And like, what does that mean? Like, it means that you understand the supply side, like no one on planet earth. I understand the demand side, like no one on planet earth. And Jason understands how to build the bridge. And like, that's why we're the team to do this. Yep. That's the story we need to tell there. So we've run out of time. Um, this slide, we'll talk about the product, which is like, it's a marketplace. We charge 18%. Like, Brands come on one side, you know, creators come on the other, like blah, blah, blah. However, we want to describe that. Our business model will just show the sort of like, you know, money is transacted from brands to creators and we take 18%. This is your stuff, um, Tiffany, balanced liquidity. So on this slide, and I wanted to spend a lot of time on this today, but we can do it some other time. So I'm going to say, you know, we've had a thousand shoots from a thousand brands paying, you know, 754 creators. So we'll come up with some sort of sentence like that. And that's going to be your and Michael's goal to go out there and chase to make that happen. But then we, I want to tell a story of the top 50 brands. And I want to tell a story of the top 50 creators and like, how many jobs were posted across the top 50 brands? How many um, jobs were done by the top 50 creators? How much money were spent by the top 50 brands? How much money was made by the top 50 creators? And then maybe some testimonials, right? Yeah. So we have like, um, this is how much money, or this is how many number jobs, number jobs, money, money, and maybe actually it's like money and then average two. So we'll say like, you know, on average, our average top 50 creator made a thousand, you know, 10,000 bucks or 20,000 bucks. And we should make up that number and go and chase it. And then I think it would be sick if we had like quotes, you know, two quotes from here and two quotes from here or something that sort of substantiate how happy our platform is and that people are like, this is life changing for me. This is life changing for me. And we're basically being like, cool, we've done a lot, but by the way, we have immense lifetime value and like we've built a really solid foundation and people are really fucking with us. So this is like our liquid, this is like the Tiffany, this is what you will work on. Tiffany is like, we will set up numbers up here which you and like you have some control over because you can get repeat business and Michael has some control over because he can get top of funnel business. And then this is really where you're going to be living is like, how many jobs do we want the top 50 brands to have done this time, six months from now, how many jobs the top creators have completed, how much money do the top 50 brands put into our platform? How much money do the top 50 creators make, which is an average of $20,000 per creator. So like this number for me, like, I'd like that to be at least a million bucks. So the top 50 creators have made 20 grand on average each. And right now I bet the top 50 creators have made seven grand on average each. So we need to create a massive shift upwards where these creators are getting all of the jobs. And by the way, we can change this if we want and manipulate it, make it 20 and 20. But if it's 50 and 50, which is arbitrary, you know, um, definitionally like these people are going to have to have paid more than that, like 1.4 million or something like that. Cause we're taking our fees out and some of them won't have gone to the top 50 creators. So a lot of money paid by the top brands, you know, maybe it's, let's see, 1.4 million divided by, a, well, I guess we could do a thousand if we're going to shoot for that at some point. So that would be 1400 jobs. Posted by the top 50 brands and then the top 50 creators, you know, thousand jobs. So I just made up those numbers, but it would be something like that. Like, and this gives us something to go out and chase. And so when you, 
you'll stand this up over the next couple of weeks, Tiffany, and really get a handle on like how to get brands to post more jobs, how to get our best creators more jobs. Like, but when you're working five or 10 hours a week, you're going to have data that Michael is going to help you stand up in one of our software systems. And you'll be able to check in on the health of these people and these people. And how are we trending and are we behind and can we hit these numbers in the next six months? And what do we have to do to make sure that this story is true? And I, I really do think this is like the kill slide. So maybe it should come higher. You know, they always say like the fifth slide is supposed to be your kill slide, which I guess is this for us. But I'd like to be like, this is when people will be like, oh, wow, like you guys are crushing it. Then growth will have, you know, month over month, Michael, just like, we'll just have, you know, little by little by little by little more and more and more jobs. And we'll show over the past 12 months, like how we've grown. And we'll show like, you know, yep, this is an average of like, average 8.2% growth MOM. Our plans to scale. So like what, like Shane and where are our funnels? So we'll like explain like, this is how we're going to go from 8% growth to 15% growth in the next year with your money. Team financials. And then probably, oops, ask. In other words, we want to raise, you know, $1.6 million and this is what it's for. Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say one idea on how we can move up that slide on like how we've been doing up is after you say like, what's the problem and then the solution, we could pose it as like, we've already solved this problem. Like we've already done X, Y, and Z sales. And like now we, we can kind of transition that into more of like our stories and how, but like that was just an idea on like how to bring it closer to the top. Totally. So I think this is really good work. Like Shannon, you crushed it. Like I think focusing us in on this whole idea of standardization and trust and like building the trusted place for content. I think yeah. that's like a very I think it's easier to explain to people than like content just isn't good enough because they don't know about content, you know? Right. And as you said, there's, there's precedent for this, right? Like there's, there's like, I like what you said about like, listen, like it's how we date, it's how we travel, it's how we stay, it's how we, you know, it's how we do everything. So like, why not content? Why isn't there a standardized way? Like, the why now slide that I'm showing right now is quite powerful. It's like everyone fucking is gobbling content. Everyone needs it. There's no place to get it in a, in like in a consistent standardized way. Every other industry is standardized. It's the future of work. Why haven't we? Yep. That's a, like, that's a perfect answer for why now. Um, um, really quickly, not related. I was just looking at our Stripe because I was interested in looking at some numbers. I don't know what our gross volume is, but it just passed $1 million, which is kind of exciting. <laughs> that is cool. That's like all the money that's gone through the platform, right? I don't know. It could be money from invoices and like it's since we stood up Stripe. We've done over $2 million in revenue since, since the company's been around. Um, yeah. But maybe it's a million dollars had passed, you know, from brands to creators. That doesn't quite sound right because we've only done 600 something shoots. So yeah, I think it's probably just all the money that we've invoiced in the past, like since we set up Stripe, but that's still like a great number. So yeah, I mean, it's real, right? Like we're not a little bit like a million dollars of revenue. Like that's a lot, even if it's, even if it's just gross revenue. Yeah. Like again, fucking outdoor voices is doing 40 million in revenue. That's awesome. But they're also losing $24 million a year. Yeah. Um, so the fact that we're doing a million bucks in revenue and that we're in, that we did a million bucks in revenue in the past year and that we're now profitable. Is okay. pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it's going to just put us in a great position in these talks because again, like the only, the only reason that we will need them is because we are emotionally tapped. Like that would be the only reason that we really need this raise to happen. But otherwise it's literally just like, we're looking for a good partner. We want some cash to really pour some gas on the fire, hire a team, move a little faster. Like th that would be the story I love. I would love to tell is like, we're cooking, man. We're, we're doing fine without you. We'd love to bring you on as a partner so that this could go faster. But if not, that's totally cool. And I think that attitude will put us in a huge position of power. Yeah. And our mission. Shannon, is at all last time. Yeah. And our mission is just 
you and I have to not burn out. Like, because if we're burnt out, we're going to be in those meetings being like, whether or not I say it, it's going to be like, save us. Like I need to tap out. I need you. And what would be way more appealing is we're chilling, man. Like we enjoy our life. We enjoy what we're doing. We're profitable. It's not the biggest business it could be because we're bootstrapping it. So it could be huge with your help. Otherwise we're chilling. So like, do you want to join or not? That's like a very different pitch than help us, help us. Like we're operating at a deficit unless we work 80 hours a week and we're miserable. Yep. Cool. I got to call my uncle. Um, do you guys have any parting thoughts? No, I think this was very productive. I agree. Cool. So yeah, we can, you know, next weekend or some other time, just like keep working on this. I, I think it's cool to like, again, Tiffany, you know, you just have this screenshotted and printed out or put in, you know, put somewhere somewhat central and it, it's not meant to be scary, but just sort of like a, this is what we're aiming for. And so you'll have something like this. And when you come into work on a random Tuesday and you're going to work two hours during the school year on that Tuesday, and you, and you have some health metrics that Michael is going to stand up for you in the full story uh, dashboard, full story is a piece of software we use. You'll be able to see like, okay, of the top 50 brands that we're tracking, like how much money, how many jobs have they done in the past 30 days? And if the answer is less than a prorated 1400, so if the answer is less than like 125, then, oh shit, like we need to increase that. How are we going to do that? And that's when you'd send out an email to the top 50, encouraging them, giving them a discount code, reminding them of something, you know, so you'll have numbers that you're chasing. And as a function of that, it will indicate what you have to do. Um, oh my gosh, like our top creators aren't making as much money as I thought. How do I make sure that we're really, you know, doing what Shannon and I have been doing, which is taking all the best jobs and dropping it right into the lap in Slack on this channel right here, the top 20. Like these are all the top people. And we're like, hey guys, there's a new job. Go check it out. Go, 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 go. To try to make sure that this number is as impressive as possible. And like, that's just going to be what you own. And this will, you know, so hopefully that gives you some real direction and something to rally around and like a story to build. And the best part is guys, is that this is bullshit. So if it ends up being 812 shoots from 812 brands paying 615 creators, I don't really care other than a thousand being a nice round number and a nice thing to have crossed line to have crossed. It doesn't really matter. Same thing, Tiffany, if we have to make this the top 30 and the top 30 and change these numbers, like we'll do what we got to do, but we just want to sort of set a course and try our hardest to reach it. And so it's just sort of a fun game. Yeah. And if you guys want to do this again next weekend, I personally find it very easy to think about this stuff in the weekend where I don't have to like switch my brain from being in the weeds to this. So yeah. Yeah. I feel the same. So I think for a while, like we should just do some higher level meetings and, you know, Michael and Tiffany, I'm aware of the, well, I guess both of you will be paid hourly. Um, Michael, I know you have a, a commission upside so you can charge, you can bill for these hours. And again, burnout, like, we got to be really careful, all of us, of like not giving too much because this only succeeds if we can sit at that table with that position of power that we really are happy and balanced and loving life. So if you guys are feeling like you need a weekend off and you don't want to join, that's fine. But I think for the next couple of weekends, Shannon and I will be sort of tightening and tightening this. And if you guys want to be a part of that, we'll obviously, you know, invite you and, and you're more than welcome. Um, cool. Cool with me. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, I really hope that I was recording this. Oh yeah, I was. Okay. Um, sick. I'll send you this, Shannon. I think we should post it. I think it was kind of interesting. <laughs>